governments have a very important role to play in enabling the safe and effective use of technologies. We need to take responsibility at every level of society to adapt to these technological challenges which are redefining what it means to be completely embedded in this world. Even though we have everyday problems we have to solve, we have to find a way to lay the foundations for the innovations of tomorrow. Okay, um, so I just wanted to share that because I wanted to, um, a couple of things. One is just to give a sense that when we talk about the fourth industrial revolution and the term that I'll use for the next 25 minutes or so, the, the, the scope of that is a little broader than, uh, for example, Industry 4.0 in Germany. So we certainly see that being much broader. The second is to give you a little flavor, a little taste of the scale of disruption, the scale of change that we anticipate coming and, uh, and why we think it's important that we address that. So what is it the World Economic Forum does? Um, are we a bunch of economists like the, uh, like the OECD or are we, we just get together with uh, you know, CEOs in, in, in for a party once a year in Davos? What we really are is the International Organization for Private Public Collaboration. And what that means is that we work in ongoing uh, partnerships, bringing together government, business, civil society, academics, scientists, and other, other stakeholders to try to develop common solutions to challenges that no one part of society can, can address by themselves. So, we're most famous, of course, for our annual meeting in Davos, where we bring together 2,500 of the world's leaders, uh, which usually is around about 1,200 CEOs, about 50 heads of state, lots of ministers, and lots of the other types, to get them to think about the future and to try to foster some trust and collaboration at the top leadership level. So why is it, what I wanted to quickly run through is, very quickly, okay, fourth industrial revolution, what we mean. But just to give you a sense as to why is it that we, as the forum, and all of our constituents are so focused on this right now. And we are focused. This was the primary theme for our annual meeting in Davos this year. And it will be again for this year to come. And in fact, we anticipate this being the primary frame for our work over the next several years. So I wanted to give you a sense of why is it that all of these world leaders are so concerned and what is it they're thinking about, right? How do they approach it? And I think from there, just to give a sense of how is it that the test beds that all of you are working on uh, potentially could fit into that and be supportive and be an important, an important part. So very quickly, uh, as mentioned there, fourth industrial revolution, first one, the big famous one, mechanization, uh, started to replace physical human labor. The second industrial revolution, we'll point this, uh, energy, electricity, the electrification started to substitute more human behavior, began to disrupt more economic models, started to allow us to organize society and economic productivity in, in different ways. The third industrial revolution, sorry, 70s and 80s with information technology was interesting because that started to substitute not human physical labor, but some of our mental abilities, and in fact, computation. The fourth industrial revolution, however, is a little bit different, and it's different in a couple of ways. I'm guessing that many of you here will know what I'm referring to when I put this up, uh, and why it's important. But not long ago, for a couple of months ago, a artificial intelligence beat a human being at a series of games of Go. Um, in fact, not just any human being, but, but our best human being, and beat them over a series of games. And this is important because the number of possible moves in Go is 200, no, is this. <laughs> which is more atoms than there are in the universe. Which is another way of saying you cannot just throw computational power at the problem. That the artificial intelligence had to learn and anticipate and expect and adjust and exhibit behaviors which are different from pure computing power. The fourth industrial revolution, as, as we describe it, is the integration of digital, physical, and biological systems. And a particular defining feature of the fourth industrial revolution is that as you start to mix these technologies together, the capabilities of the technologies and the capabilities of what we can bring to bear in the real world uh, in terms of using them, suddenly it accelerates
rates at an exponential rate. So where did this come from? Why did we start talking about this? So there was a, uh, there was a wide range of signals that we got from our broader set of stakeholders and from our expert groups. And I'm just going to pick out a couple to give you a sense of some of, the, some of the messages that we got over the past couple of years and why we've made this a central pillar of, of what we will do going forward. In fact, uh, and I'll mention later, the forum has just announced that we will open our fourth location. We've been in existence for 45 years. We're going to open our fourth location. Uh, we're going to open a center for the fourth industrial revolution in, in San Francisco. So what were some of the initial, the, the, be, the beginnings of this? Uh, first was actually uh, work that we did specifically focusing on industrial internet of things. Uh, this was started a couple of years ago. We, uh, in fact, started this project the same month that the Industrial Internet Consortium was uh, founded. So we pretty quickly found each other and started to, started to collaborate. And what did we do here? We had a very different purpose when we were doing this work. What we wanted to do was to try and do a little bit of a survey of the land for uh, the, the, the leader level perspective. What is it that this industrial internet thing is about? Uh, how important is it going to be? What do we need to know right, from a CEO or minister level perspective? So we went out and we had a bunch of workshops and we did surveys, we did interviews with uh, chief technology officers, chief strategy officers from a range of different companies, industrial technology, others like automotive and health. And we found a few things. First of all, we found, this probably won't be too surprising to you, we found that of course industrial internet brings lots of opportunity for operational efficiency. Secondly, there's a short step between operational efficiency and the ability to develop new services. For example, predictive maintenance. Thirdly, we start to see something interesting with the emergence of ecosystems. So these new services are not just being emerging from individual companies, but from collections of companies across different industries. And finally, we see this term, this idea of kind of the autonomous uh, economy or the pull economy. This is perhaps not here just yet, but you could imagine once we adopt industrial internet at scale and you're connecting consumers with real-time demand back through automated supply chains, you get this pull effect where everything is automated and on demand. So if you think about this from a, from a CEO point of view, what does that mean? It means, okay, we need to change our operational, we may change our operational model. We are looking at new business models. Industry ecosystems, or maybe our industry structures are changing. Right? And maybe you start to see that the, 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 the convergence that we've seen in some sectors, for example, TMT, we're starting to see now in other sectors as well. And once you get to the autonomous pull economy, effectively you're talking about changing the structure of the economy itself. So this was all interesting. But this isn't really what made us sit up and pay attention. What really made us sit up and pay attention is this. Across all of the people that we engaged and surveyed, across a broad range of industries, heavy industries included, and health and automotive and the rest of them, 72% said that they felt that the industrial internet would be disruptive to their industry. 78% said that they expected this within five years. And 88% said that they felt their company wasn't ready. Now this is striking for a number of reasons. But let me just give you two. One is, this is the first time in 45 years of working that we had ever had any indication from whether it's soft data, hard data, conversations, discussions, from the leaders within heavy industry sectors of substantive change to their sector in anything less than decades. We fully anticipated that the, what we would get here is in 20, 30, 40 years. This is the first time they said no, five years. The second reason is striking. Think about what this says from a GDP point of view. So we hear every day that the internet has changed our lives. But if we think about it from an industry vertical point of view, how many industries has it fundamentally disrupted? One or two? I mean, certainly media. Media, entertainment, and information. That's been turned upside down and inside out for the last 15 years. Maybe a little bit of financial services. Sometimes people say, I don't think it's been fundamentally disrupted yet. Retail, retail and commerce, maybe a little. But if we now look 
market across all, and, and what is that as a percentage of GDP? I mean, depending on the, the, the country, that's probably around about 15% of GDP. So what this is saying is that the change that we've seen so far is just the beginning. It's just the appetizer. The main course is to come. And this is significant. Okay, a second completely independent group. Um, we had a, 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 a collection of uh, experts on uh, software, um, so people who were at the cutting edge of, of, of developing software for the past 20, 30 years, and we had them in a group talking about software and societal impact. And this group felt that there was a fundamental deep shift that, the, that our society is about to go through. And they felt that it was going to impact every industry and every policy domain in everybody's lives. But they felt that the majority of leaders in our society didn't really understand the scale and scope of the change to come. And so they set themselves a challenge. They said, how are we going to be able to describe this to people in a way that will, will get their attention? And they said their, 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 uh, their objective was that whatever way we describe it has to be understandable by CEOs, by ministers, and by our grandmothers. That was the challenge they set themselves. So they said, okay, well, why don't we pick some of these technologies, okay, software technologies, and then they started to branch out into IoT, and then they started to branch out into blockchain and, 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 and quantum computing, and they said, well, look, we can't leave out gen genetic coding and 3D printing. So let's add those things in, and let's, let's, let's imagine a, an event, a proxy event that would demonstrate that this, the adoption of this technology was now hitting scale. So this one event, presumably when this one happens, it means that we're basically kind of okay with it, and it's about to hit that curve. So for example, one of the, one of the items was the first transplant of a 3D, uh, 3D printed humor, uh, liver. Right? The first human transplant of a 3D printed liver. When that happens, okay, we, we know we're on the road. And, and let's survey a whole bunch of people, including experts, the guy who's bringing the first quantum, uh, quantum chip on silicon at room temperature by 2020. Let's bring the genetic coding guy. Let's, let's ask them to take the survey, but let's also ask a bunch of young people in, in Europe. Let's ask a bunch of youth in, in South Africa. Let's ask a bunch of policymakers in uh, Europe and Japan. Let's survey everybody, see what they all think. And let's get an aggregate picture. And we'll give them, you know, six months, a year, five years, ten years, fifty years, a hundred years, never. And then we can see which ones are coming soon. So this is what they found. Across everybody, and experts from youth in Johannesburg were indistinguishable. Everybody expected these changes to come much faster than we had, had, had anticipated. In fact, by 2025, over 50% of respondents expected this event to have happened, except for one, which is the bottom one, right here. And that was the only one that the group had put in as a trick, because that one actually had already happened. <laughs> you map it out across a timeline, and all of a sudden you start to, you, you know, you, your head starts to really hurt. What happens when you start putting quantum together with AI, together with blockchain, and apply that to geno genomic decoding? I mean, we're, we're, all of these technologies are the, the individually coming much faster than we expected. And when you start to combine them, we start to uh, come into the realm of, of, of what we all thought was science fiction. But we don't really know exactly what it's going to so, as I say, these were two, uh, two particular groups. I could have picked any number, but clearly there is a significant shift coming. And that meant that we wanted to really address that. So what is it that we do? What is it that we have been doing? Well, as I say, we bring together uh, leaders, and essentially we're a platform that, very similar to Industrial Internet Consortium, we're a platform for building trust and for building collaboration. And if you, if you think about, you know, sometimes we're, we're all familiar with the idea that often what holds back uh, the adoption of technology is not necessarily the readiness of technology itself. It's all of the pieces around it, right? Is, is it socially acceptable? Do we have the policies in place? Is there investment? Is some legacy regulation preventing it? Uh, have we addressed the, the ethical and, 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 and normative questions? So 
if you like, that's the, that's the space that, 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 we, that we work in. And so we bring together uh, leaders and we help them try to work through these questions. So some typical questions that you would certainly get from a business perspective. Uh, you know, of course, you know, how is the broader context changing? How will that change our business model? Um, how can we be thinking better in terms of operational efficiency? Should we be innovating differently? Should we be thinking in, uh, you know, in terms of collaborative R&D? How are our relationships with our stakeholders? How do we build partnerships in, 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 in ecosystems? How do you make the business case for that? What's the different relationship we have with, with uh, our customers and citizens? And increasingly, they're becoming much more interested in engaging in an ongoing dialogue with policymakers to try and co-design policy around this. The governments, of course, have their own questions. How on earth do we manage this transition? That first, first industrial revolution took place over a period of about 40, 50 years and involved significant social dislocation and disruption. And if you just take the jobs and skills issue, let alone the fact that the way that we produce outcomes and, and, and what it does to demand and so on. If you just take the jobs piece, there's a huge challenge in the government's minds right now. Of course, they're also thinking, well, how do we make our country attractive? Uh, certainly, Barcelona, Spain has its answer, bring you all here, that's not a bad one. But there are broader questions around policy. What do we need to do to protect our citizens? How do we balance the need to allow flows of data across borders in order to stimulate economic activity with the need for privacy and security. Given the rate of accelerate, the accelerated rate of the, not just the development of technology, but its adoption, how on earth do we keep up? And in fact, do we even have the right institutions for the 21st century? Or do we actually need to completely reimagine what governance and policy making look like? Because if we don't, is anyone going to follow our rules? Or will other formats and the global connected or big, large organizations, large companies, will they just effectively start creating the rules for the 21st century? But more broadly, together, they start to ask some much bigger questions. And these are questions which I think we all need to think about in terms of where we are going in our society. Um, and, I, and I say that, I say that because I want to, I, I firmly believe that what collectively you are all doing here and what in fact we are all doing here is we are laying the foundations for the shape and structure of our society and civilization for generations to come. You know, that first industrial revolution, we still feel the effects, we still s observe that in our social culture today. I mean, just think about school holidays. Why do we have school holidays in the summertime? is so that all the children can go out and harvest in the fields. None of our children go and harvest in fields today. We still have school holidays in the summer for all of our children. So certainly one big question is, you know, as a generation or a collection of generations, we have some grand challenges, right? We have uh, widespread poverty and food insecurity uh, and, and, and uh, health and disease for a large portion of the humans on the planet. Okay? We have environmental issues, whether it's oceans or the climate or forests. Okay? Can these technologies help us to address the grand challenges for our society? What values should we be building into these technologies? Clearly, the, I mean, the, the, the question that's often framed today in terms of AI, but it, actually it's much broader. What values are we trying to trying to protect and promote. If you think about platforms, and particularly B2C platforms, are, are we really creating an a, a, a increase in the opportunity for economic activity where small business holders can go and kind of, you know, just jump on a platform and, and, and start trading? Or are we, in fact, concentrating the wealth and the power into a smaller and smaller number of hands? How do we measure value? So I know how this uh, TV screen contributes to GDP. I know how this shirt, I know how a glass of book. There's a line item in the national accounts that accounts for that. But guaranteed engine uptime? Show me the line item for that. Or guaranteed crop yields to farmers? We, 
don't have we don't know how to measure the value that we're producing and so it's, it's it disappears but more broadly if we are entering into a phase where actually we can produce pretty much everything that humans will want and need with a far greater uh, degree of human labor input well then what is it that we're going after anyway if not growth what is it that our society should be aiming for okay so these are a range of questions from the very immediate right operational efficiency all down to, to gosh what are we all trying to do and they're all happening at the same time so how do we how do we tackle this well the we bring as I say we bring the leaders together and we try to get them to think about these questions the problem is the difficulty is is that for the majority of the leaders that we're bringing together technology is their three-year-old granddaughter playing on her iPad or perhaps technology is a set of buzzwords or perhaps technology is just pure magic and it's very very difficult for them to be able to ground the discussion in something real and so often they want to do something they're trying to understand but it's very difficult for them to be able to so, okay, how do we do this? So, we, yes, we bring them together round tables, board level toolkits, we do country level partnerships. But this problem exists throughout all of that. How do we do that? So, this is where I think that the test beds actually could play a really, really pivotal role. Because while the primary intent for creating all of the test beds is to try to understand and prove out all of the technology dimensions, to the earlier point that in order for adoption to really work, you need all of those other pieces as well. Well, let's use the same use cases to look at both the technology as well as the implications. So let's look at uh, real-time fleet management, or let's look at microgrid applications, or let's look at uh, the, the, the emergency services piece. Let's look at uh, smart grids across borders, and then use them as use cases and say, okay, through this value chain, what happens to human labor now at each point along this value chain? What happens to the skills required? And what do we need to then do to prepare for that? Or what, happen, what, what are the implications from a security point of view? Or what are the implications from a privacy point of view? Or a data interoperability point of view? And let's start to help leaders get past the hype and ground discussions in reality and start getting them to develop policies and set directions to set strategies that actually help enable and, and accelerate the, uh, the, the, the adoption of the uh, industrial internet. So right now, we've just been working with uh, Richard and the team to identify the first one or two, where we would take these and turn them into leader-level infographics. And when I say leader-level, remember I mean CEOs, ministers, and, and, and our mothers. So things that anybody can understand, and then use them as a common set of tools to be able to identify what are the specific actions that we are asking of, uh, of leaders in our society in order to help uh, not just accelerate this, but to ensure that we accelerate it in a safe, resilient uh, way that, that, that brings equity, uh, equitable benefits to different parts of society. So that's almost it for me. I'll just leave you with a couple of final, final thoughts. As we are having these conversations with leaders, there's four principles that we always, uh, that we always have try to instill in our discussions. So the first one is to think in terms of systems and not technologies. For non-technologists, for whatever, it's very funny, when we bring together non-technologists with technologists, the non-technologists want to talk about technology and the other way around. So for, for leaders, don't think about the technology. Think about the economic, the operational, the human, the political, the policy systems that that technology is going to now transform. Second, think of technology as empowering and not determining. Technology doesn't happen to us. We, 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 we have a choice about how we use these technologies in our society. So let's start actively making those choices. Let's start thinking about these choices and build them in by design, not by default as the minister mentioned earlier. Uh, and finally, 
let's think about the values that we want to pr protect, the values that we want to advance as a feature that we proactively build into these technologies that are shaping our society as we go forward. Let's think about them proactively as a feature and not as a bug. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Have a great few days.